the numbers are bigger than you, but I am. He can bring you out no matter what it looks like. I am. Say, I am. I am. One more time, say, God says, I am. Just lean on him because I am. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Greater Joy Community Church. Welcome to worship. It is Pentecost Sunday, and we are hallelujah happy for the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank God for the Holy Ghost this morning. That when Jesus ascended into heaven after the resurrection, he didn't leave us alone, but he left us with his Holy Spirit to comfort, to lead, to direct, and to rebuke us. And so today we're going to talk about the Holy Ghost, who is our helper. Come on, let's bow in prayer and ask the Lord our God to bless our time together in worship. Eternal God, our Father, it is another day's journey and we are indeed glad about it. We come on God this morning with a grateful heart because we serve a good God who's made us some promises that we can stand on. We thank you, oh God, that you are a promise keeper. Thank you, oh God, for being faithful to your word. We thank you for the promise of the Holy Ghost this morning. Lord, we love you and we love your word. And you said in your word that if we seek you early, that we'll find you. God, we come chasing after you this morning because you hold in your hand every single thing that we need. Like the deer pants for the water, our souls thirst for you. So now, God, would you bless this sacred hour of worship and would you make your presence known and felt? Help us, oh God, to be open to your leading and sensitive to your speaking. Alert us, oh God, to the calling of your voice this morning. We invite you now into our personal spaces and places. In fact, oh God, we invite that same power that was at work when Jesus was raised from the grave to be present with us now. Lord, we declare that you are welcome in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say it together, amen. And amen again. Amen. We'll now have a few morning announcements by Deacon Antonio Haynes at this time.
Good morning, Greater Joy friends and family. This is Deacon Antonio Haynes with just a few brief announcements for you this morning. To start off, we want to welcome all those joining us in the virtual world. We say welcome on behalf of our pastor and the Greater Joy Community Church family. We hope that something is said or done that invites you back to worship with us again and that you continue to worship with Greater Joy Community Church. Moving on, we want to recognize our weekly announcements. This week going on in the life of Greater Joy Community Church, uh, we have Tuesday, our I Believe prayer call at 7 p.m. On Wednesday, we have Bible study at 7 p.m. Thursday, choir rehearsal at 7, and then Saturday morning, we have our diaconate meeting at 10 a.m. So busy week for Greater Joy. Tuesday, I Believe prayer call at 7 on Zoom. Wednesday, Bible study at 7 on Zoom. And Thursday, choir rehearsal at 7 at Henning building door number 20, which is located in the back of the school. And Saturday morning, our diaconate meeting at 10 a.m. to follow. We want to remind you of the upcoming events in the life of Greater Joy Community Church. And for the month of June, on June 5th at 6.30 p.m., we have a church business meeting. This is a meeting of importance to discuss all of the activities and finances of the church. So we ask that you be on Zoom at 6.30 p.m. on Monday, June 5th. June 9th, 10th, and 11th is the youth weekend for Greater Joy Community Church. So calling all youth, we have more information to come from our youth department on the activities that will take place that weekend. Sunday, June 18th is Father's Day. So there will be Father's Day service starting at 11 a.m. There will probably be something a little, uh, something planned for the fathers that morning. So we ask that you stay tuned in for that. Govern yourselves accordingly so that you can be prepared for that as well. And on, I think it's Friday, June 30th, we will have our GJCC fellowship activity. Last time we went bowling, we had a great, great time celebrating our church anniversary. This time it will be something completely different, but it is an opportunity for us to get together outside of the church and just enjoy each other's company and fellowship together and to love on each other. So we ask that if you are available, you mark your calendar for June 30th, 8 p.m. GJCC fellowship opportunity. Moving on, we want to call all graduates. Congratulations to the graduates. Uh, Sunday, June 25th, I believe it is, we are doing our graduate ceremony. You still have until next Sunday, June 4th, to turn in your graduate information. We will send out the link again this week for anyone who has not completed it. If you do need a hard copy, please contact myself, Deacon Antonio Haynes, or Reverend Sharon Battle, we will make sure you get a hard copy if you need one, but we want to take the opportunity to recognize all graduates. This is from all areas, from preschool, elementary, middle, high school, graduate school, vocational, whatever it may be, we want to recognize the graduates. So if you need a form, please see myself or Reverend Sharon Battle. We want to continue to keep our family and friends that are on the prayer list in prayer. Today we have Sister Dallary Briley, Sister Reba Bonaparte, Sister Patricia Daniels, Brother Vernon Harris, Deacon George Hembrick, Brother Dwayne Hembrick, Sister Eileen Herring, Sister Miriam Jackson, Ernestine Kirkland and Clarence Mitchell, Carol Morton Jr., Mother Marin Robinson, Priscilla Robinson, Sister Elizabeth Ruffin, and Sister Brenda Scott. And as always, if you have anyone you wanna to add to the prayer list, a uh, request for visitation for communion or prayer, please contact the church. We can make sure we make that happen. Contact information for the church is 804-601-8569. You can call that number and leave a message, or you can also text that number or email the church at greaterjoyrva at gmail.com. We want to remind you for the opportunities to support the ministry and thank you for those who have so graciously supported the ministry throughout the years and so far this year. You can support the ministry in three different ways. The first way is Givelify. Just download the Givelify app and search for Greater Joy Community Church. You can find it that way. The second way is Cash App. If you have Cash App, just put in dollar sign GJCCRVA. Again, dollar sign GJCCRVA. And the third way is you can mail in your tithes, offerings, and donations to Greater Joy Community Church, P.O. Box 2202, Richmond, Virginia, 23218. Thank you for your support in advance. And as always, we recite our giving affirmation over our giving. It says, Lord, with a cheerful heart, I sow my seed. Today, I planted in good ground. I believe my needs are met and my family is blessed. 
And I'm expecting a supernatural harvest in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for your time and attention, greater joy. Hope you enjoy the service. We will now turn the service over for our morning devotions. We have Sister Alita Miranda coming with our scripture and prayer. Be blessed. Good morning, Greater Joy. Good morning, family. I'll be reading the word this morning from Exodus 34, verses 27 through 35. Then the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Bless the word, Lord. I will now read from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And I will also read verses 12 through 13. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Hallelujah. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And verse 12 reads, so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Other mock, others mocking said, they are full of new wine. May the Lord continue to bless and add an additional blessing to his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we come to you now. We ask for forgiveness, firstly. We, we fall short many times, and we ask you to forgive us for our shortcomings. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy, Lord God. We thank you for waking us up every morning with the ability to try again, with the ability to bless your name again and again and again. God, you are the great I am. 
And for this, we love you and we praise you. We ask that you bless uh, this congregation. We ask that you bless our pastor. We ask that you bless our pastor's family. We ask that you bless everyone that is hearing her voice today, that is listening to the word that you are to deliver today, Lord God. God, we love you. We are thankful for everything that you have done for us, everything that you are doing, and we are grateful and thankful for all of our futures, for you know all of the plans that you have in store for us, God. We are grateful for this Pentecost Sunday, Lord God. We ask that you cover us, cover our nation, cover our states, cover this world, Lord God. We pray for our children. We pray for protection, Lord God. We pray for healing. Touch those who need you right now. You are our healer. You are everything, Lord God. We come to you with one voice and with one sound. We all come to you on one accord. And we ask that you continue to be with us throughout all of the things that we do within this lifetime. God, we bless your name. And we ask that you seal this prayer in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Father, in the name of Jesus, we honor you. We bless you this morning for the privilege that is ours to hear your word proclaimed. You know our name. God, we're so grateful that you call us each by name, that you know each of our circumstances, each of our situations. And I'm going to ask you now, God, that you would grant me in this preaching moment clarity of mind, concision of speech, conviction of heart that I might in this moment tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth for your glory and for our good. In Jesus name, amen and amen. This morning, for the moment that we have together, I'm gonna lift up Ephesians, the first chapter, New Testament book of Ephesians, the first chapter. And I'm gonna read into your hearing verses 11 through 14. And we found these words recorded in Ephesians first chapter, and I'm going to lift them from the Christian standard Bible. And it says, in him, we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. So that we who had already put our hope in Christ might been praised to his glory. In him, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. For the moments that we have together, I want to preach with this thought in mind. Praise God for the Holy Ghost. Praise God for the Holy Ghost. Diamonds are fascinating stones, y'all. You, you might be surprised to find out that what separates a brilliant, blinging diamond from dull and dark diamonds is not its size. I, I was shocked when I heard that. Maybe you're not surprised about that, but, but I was because I thought, like many others thought, that the size of the diamond creates the brilliance and the blingage that we've come to appreciate in these expensive gems. But the reality is something called facets, the multi-angular surfaces of the stone. Those that permit and refract light actually are what creates the brilliance of a diamond. And you can own a deep, dark diamond and it will never shine. Or you can own a shallow and clear diamond and barely be able to contain the brightness of the rock that shines back at you because facets, the flat surfaces on the geometric shape of the diamond are what make a diamond flash color and throw beams. And when we come, y'all, to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, the mind of the apostle is ablaze with the brilliance of God's riches that flash from every facet of Christ's redemptive work in every believer. Light, friends, is flashing everywhere in this text. And in a word, the Bible proclaims that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heaven in Christ. In other words, y'all, when you place your faith in Jesus, heaven emptied its treasury upon the impoverished state of your soul. There is nothing that you could ever want or ever need from a spiritual perspective that God has not already lavished upon you in Jesus Christ. God gave us so much in Jesus Christ that if after having been saved, we went back to God and asked for something more. The God of the universe would simply pull his pockets inside out like a pauper on the side of the road and look at you and say, I've got nothing else to give. So this morning we do as the scripture reads in light of the brilliance of God's riches poured upon us. We praise God. We sing. We raise our hands, lift our voices. We shout for our soul's great joy until God's glory gets praised. 
Yeah, that that that's what that's what what and 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 what are the facets you might ask? What what are the facets of Christ's redemptive work that are at work in my life? Here's the first facet I want you to hear given to us in verse four. Here it is that God chose you before the foundation of the world. Stop right there. Hold up. Wait a minute. Of all the people in the world and all of the world and all of the times in which to choose, God chose you before you knew that you were a choice to be made. Charles Barkley helps me out with this. And that Capital One commercial where it says this is the easiest decision in the history of decisions to get an account at Capital One. Y'all know the commercial. The little girl is standing at the outdoor playground getting ready to make her pick for a pickup game. And, and big barreling Charles Barkley is standing there towering over the little kids around him. And the little girl says, give me Charles. And he stands up and he's throwing up his hands and he's screaming, yes, yes, I've still got it. I told you she would pick me first. And we laugh just as we should. But, but even our culture recognizes that people don't get picked who do not add value to the squad. And so the question you've then got to ask when you get to verse four of Ephesians chapter one is why would God pick you? when you didn't have anything to add to the squad. That, that's one facet, that, that's one facet. But the second facet is God forgave you and redeemed you and made known to you the mystery of his will. We rejoice as we look at the brilliance of God's riches and, and not only the fact that Christ picked us, but, but when he picked us, he forgave us and he washed us clean and he redeemed us. And then he made known to us the riches of his will. Now, and now, now we turn to facets three and four that I read into your hearing earlier. He gave to you an inheritance. And then he sealed you by his Holy Spirit. I want to ask you today, what more do you need? I, I mean, really, how much harder does God have to work to receive the praise from you for his glory? Well, the good news, y'all, this morning is whether you praise him or not, whether I praise him or not, the entire section of Ephesians chapter one is a doxology. It's, it's a kind of praise chorus in light of the magnificent grace of God showered upon every believer. All of this is done to the praise of his glorious grace in verse six, that we might bring praise to his glory in verse 12, to the praise of his glory in verse 14. You would think, y'all, that, that God is a kind of a praise addict when you come to Ephesians, but that's not the claim of Ephesians. It's not that God is hungry for worship as if he starved for something that he does not have. No, no. The claim of Ephesians is that the natural reaction of creation praises God for his glory. And so can I tell you that whether you shout or not, whether you lift your voice on Pentecost Sunday or not, whether your heart is full or not, the fact that you are where you are, you are a walking testimony that God is better than best, that God's gooder than good, and that God's richer than rich. And you can play cool if you want to, but every time the sun rises in the morning and kisses the moon as it it retreats from its perch in the sky every time the rain falls from the heaven and waters the dry ground every time the blue jay and the robins are singing their melodious tune in the trees every time the treetops bend in the wind as if they're bowing in adoration of God's splendor it's all creation shouting praise to the glory of God you ought to praise him you, you you really ought to praise him, but, but what should you praise God for? Here it is. You ought to praise him because this text argues that the efficacy of God's plan for your life cannot be thwarted. Oh, let me say that again. Perhaps you didn't shout because you didn't hear me. Here it is. This text says that God's will, that, 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 that God, in fact, has a will for your life that cannot be thwarted, cannot be 
frustrated. Here it is, verse 11, in him. We have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in the counsel of his own will. Yeah, yeah, we have, the Bible says, an inheritance. Christian standard says received an inheritance. The original language points to obtaining an inheritance and it has been given to us, portioned to us, appointed to us by God's divine will. How many of you have ever wondered what God's will is for your life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that that's a common question. That's a common wrestle or common struggle. Don't act cute. Like you ain't never pondered, wondered, struggled with God's will, God's purpose, God's plan for your life. And this text argues that there are two facets of God's will. One is God's determined will. The other is God's desired will will. But within the scope of the will of God, he has so fixed your life that you receive an inheritance. Now, now that don't mean something to all of us because some of us have spent more money putting our loved ones away at their demise than we received in our bank accounts at their demise. So, so, so the question becomes, what does an inheritance actually mean? How how does it make me feel? Well, well, if you've never received an inheritance, I've got good news for you. This text argues that you are both God's inheritance and that God obtains or God grants to you an inheritance in Christ. That, that, that we are the lot that God receives because of his redemptive work in Christ, but we are also partakers in the riches of God when we place our faith in Christ. Oh, let me say it this way. Here it is, that we are his portion and he is our prize. This inheritance points to the fact that we belong to him and he's blessed us with himself, that we are secure twice over. But, but how does it work? Here it is. The Bible says in him. Mark it down. It says in him four times. It's repeated in verses four, seven, 11, and 13. The phrase in him is a particular construction that talks about location. In other words, there are some parts of the Bible that speak to agency or instrumentation that, that we get things by the power of God or by Christ Jesus in some ways. But, but that's not how this text reads. This text reads that we got this in him. It, it, it's a word of location. It, in other words, because of our union in Christ, we now have this inheritance. Oh, so wait a minute. So, so, so if you don't know Jesus, my invitation to you starts right now because none of what I'm preaching applies to you. This, this only applies to people who are in union with Jesus Christ. That <laughs> there are different types of unions, you know, that there, there, there are labor unions. Uh, labor unions were once for the benefit and protection of workers against the greed of corporate interests. It's, it's a union of protection. And so when you, when you get into that union, that's what you buy into. That there's another union we, we watched as the world was struck by Prince Harry's choice of Meghan Markle. And though their marriage has exposed some of the trauma within the royal family, her life is now forever changed. Her children, Archie and Lilibet Diana, are seventh and eighth, respectively, in the line for the throne. <laughs> Listen, they, they may never get the throne, but they're in line for it. And her children are in line for the throne because of who she married. <laughs> that union has changed the rest of her life. On one hand, there's a union of protection, like, like labor unions. This, this marriage, this is a union of prospect, but, but there's 
one more. <laughs> There's one more union that I like better. My my picture of a union that that changed somebody's life. There's a story of a young man who called the radio station on Valentine's Day looking to propose to his girlfriend, and and so he called into the station and he's asked uh, for some advice. He's asking for advice because he's nervous, and they said, "Well, why are you so nervous? Does she not like you?" <laughs> Are you not sure that she's actually going to say yes? And he said, no, no, none, none of that. I'm I'm sure she likes me and I'm sure that she's the girl. They said, so then why in the world are you so nervous? Do do you know that 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 she's not going to say yes or something? He said, no, no. Uh, do, do, do you not know how you're going to propose? He said, no, I got it all figured out. I, I've got my camera and I've got the photographer in place. And so they said, what in the world then are you so nervous about? And the young man said, well, we, we've been dating for a few years and she didn't know how rich I am. So then they thought that thing was funny and they started to pry. They started asking some questions and, and they said, well, how rich are you? <laughs> and he said, well, the best way I can explain it is my grandfather's last name is Walgreens and my trust fund kicks in at the end of the year. <laughs> He was the grandson of Charles Rudolph Walgreen III, and he had been dating her wealthy beyond measure uh, and, and now told her that, that now that he's fallen in love, he, he just wants to be with him. But he was not aware, she was not aware of just how rich she was about to become. Can I tell you that when you united with Christ, all of the poverty, all of the world that consumed your life lifted you above and beyond. And now you are rich beyond measure. You have attained an inheritance. Now, now don't you shout and, and, and clap if, 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 if you still think I'm talking about money. This, this text ain't got nothing to do with money. The, the riches, the man in the world, uh, the richest man in the world is the poorest man in the universe if he doesn't have Christ. And, and if all you ever live for is uh, money and cars and houses and fame, then you're a poor man. But, but this text says that we've got riches beyond riches. That, that, that's what we need most. We need things that money cannot buy. When was the last time you walked in the store and there was peace that you could take off the shelf and put in your basket? When, when was the last time you could purchase hope from the grocery store? When was the last time Amazon delivered joy directly to your front door? Friends, we've got things that money cannot buy. We've got forgiveness. We've got redemption. We've got peace. We've got hope. We've got a future. We've got joy and we've got the Holy Ghost. And it doesn't matter what the world does. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Oh, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm, I'm better than blessed. And, and I don't mean to push you, but I'm preaching to my own self today because sometimes when you think of the riches of the goodness of God, it ought to make you feel even what I feel now, barely able to contain yourself. <laughs> oh, I'm a rich woman. <laughs> I, I, I'm a rich woman. I might not look rich to you, but I'm a rich woman. And, and this is a picture of how union with Christ changes your life. And all of this was done according to the predetermined plan of God. You need to mark that down in your Bible. <laughs> the predetermined plan of God. This text says that God knew you were going to be born when you were going to be born before your daddy <laughs> caught the whiff of your mama's perfume. Before the sparkle in her eye prompted him to say, what's up? Before Teddy P or Luther V had invented that song that was played on the night you were conceived, God had already ordained that not, not only that you would be born, but, but that he was going to save you. <laughs> So, so even when you were out there wilding out, doing things that you know you ain't got no business doing, sleeping with women and men that you had no business sleeping with, you had no idea you were a marked woman. You had no idea you were a marked man. So even though you went so far, God had a spiritual leash on your neck so that you couldn't get too far. And when you did, he 
pulled you back, reeled you back in and brought you back into the fold. God predetermined, pre-made up his mind that you would get this inheritance. <laughs> but let me tell you, he did it. He did it and he did it under the counsel of his own will. Y'all have, have got to appreciate what the Bible has to say here. <laughs> That God is so much God that, that he's his own counselor. What? Did you hear what I say? Do, do, do you know how many counselors the president of the United States has? A lot. Do, do you know how many people successfully represent themselves in front of a judge? Very few. Uh, th there's an old saying that says, if a lawyer is his or her own counsel, then they have a fool for a client. You know why? Because they cannot get beyond their own personal interests. Their judgment is clouded and their vision cannot grasp the facts. And, and so they end up representing themselves and doing themselves a disservice. But God is so much God that he doesn't have to hire outside counsel to think through every possible contingency. But God is so much God that he threw, uh, thought through every detail of your life. He arranged and rearranged things so that when he got done with you, you would look just like what he purposed you to look like. This text is a guarantee, y'all, that you're going to turn out the way God wants you to turn out when God gets through with you. Ask me how I know. Ask me how I know. Here it is. The Bible says he predetermined this under the counsel of his own will. In other words, God's will is so determined that, that he had thought through every contingency that nothing can happen in life that will ruin his path to get you to where he wants you to be. It, it, his name is Gutsan Borglum. Gutsan Borglum sculpted Mount Rushmore and South Dakota. It took 15 years for them to chisel out Mount Rushmore. Loads of dynamite, jackhammers, chisels, blades, mallets, and hammers. And what Mr. Borglum did when he created 60-inch uh, models of Washington, Jefferson, Roosevelt, and Lincoln. And he looked at that rock and even though it was rugged and dark and without form, he saw something in that rock that nobody else saw. He, he looked at that rock and he saw Washington's face, Jefferson's face, Roosevelt's face and Lincoln's face. And so he took a small model of 60 inches and chiseled out every eyebrow, every nose, every cheekbone, every lip, every glare and every stare. And, and, and he said one inch, for one foot, for every foot. And, and, and he went up to that rock and, and rather than doing 60 inch replicas, he did 60 foot replicas. And, and they went in and, and with dynamite and blew up that big stone. And then the men came down with their jackhammers. And every day they, they had to send the blades of the jackhammers over to the blacksmiths because the rock they were chiseling into was dulling the blade. And, and so the blacksmiths were just as busy as the men chiseling up at the top of that mountain. And 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 but 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 then it got beyond the dynamite, y'all, and, and it got beyond the jackhammers, and it came time to where Borglum had to go and start knocking his hammer against that mallet and and he had to push out Roosevelt's eyes and and he had to carve out Lincoln's lips and when he got done people started coming from all over the world in 1945 to see the master crafter and to see what he was able to build out of the bulky rock an exact replica of the small models that had first been made and and he won awards and acclaim because he was able to take some 
something dark and without form and turn it into some image that is spectacular. And if you think that I'm still talking about Mount Rushmore, then you miss my turn because there is another model whose name is Jesus Christ. And when God looked at you, he saw in you what you could be and what you will be. And sometimes God has had to take dynamite and blow your life all the way up. And when your life had fallen apart, he's, he's loosening up rock up off of you. And then God got personal in his prayer time and, and took his mallet and took his hammer and started knocking off the pieces of your life so that when God gets done, I said, when God gets done, you're going to come out looking just like the model, just like the man, Christ Jesus. And is there anybody here who can just thank God for the rough moments in your life that you can praise him that when life hurts, you can rejoice because now you're obtaining an inheritance. Somebody ought to shout an inheritance. Woo, you're going to look just like Jesus. I'm done. I'm done. You're going to look like Jesus, but you have the certainty and the efficacy of God's plan. It, it, it cannot be frustrated. That, that then there's a word in this text about security. This word about security. It, it is the undisputed security that you are God's property. Verse 13 says, in him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. Holy Spirit is the down payment for our inheritance. Mark it down. Bible says the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. Let me see if I can make this clear today. That, that, that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've got the Holy Ghost. I, I, I'm not messing with anybody's doctrine or anybody's denomination. I'm just preaching the Bible right here. The text says that you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth and when you believed. The, the time you heard the gospel, can, 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 can you go back to that moment for a minute? W when you heard the gospel and, and the light bulb went off in your mind and you said, that's for me. That, 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 that word is for me. And, and in that moment, you planted your feet firmly in faith in the confidence of Jesus Christ. In that contemporaneous moment, God gave you the Holy Spirit, yes, he did. What well, well, you say, well, 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 why can't I talk in tongues? Well, what about the people who talk in tongues? Listen, I don't have that in my sermon today. All I'm telling you is that when you got saved, God gave you the Holy Ghost, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, share essence. They are three in one. And, and so in other words, when you place your faith, when, when you got saved, when, when you heard the gospel of salvation, God gave you his spirit. And his spirit now takes up residence in your life. And the reason I'm your pastor, the reason I'm preaching to you every week is because I'm trying to move you simply from letting God have residence in your life to letting God be president in your life. We, we shout all day. We shout all day that we've been saved. But friends, the beauty of a relationship with Jesus Christ is that he is Lord. Oh, oh you got the Holy Ghost. Yeah, you got the Holy Ghost. But what does the Holy Ghost do? Holy Ghost is a helper. The Holy Ghost comforts us, speaks to us, tells us what God has to do. But, but this text also teaches us that the Holy Ghost seals you to the day of redemption. Mark it down. The Holy Ghost seals you. The, the, the way that the text is written in the original language is that the word you, us, us in, in the emphatic position, that word's in the emphatic position in the text. In other words, what the Holy Spirit impressed upon the pen of Paul to say is that after all that God has done for you, having picked you, forgiven you, let you into the mystery of his will, and then have you obtained an inheritance. You, yes, you have been sealed by the Holy Ghost. 
that this is one reason why we argue and I need to say this so so you tuck it away and don't let nobody else take it from you don't let nobody snatch it from you don't don't let nobody steal your confidence in this from you listen once you are saved you cannot then lose your salvation what <laughs> once you are saved you can't then become unsay I need you to hear what I'm saying you may be God's wildest child but you're still a child and somebody's parent ought to have rejoiced right there because you've got one or two of them wild jokers yourself and they might be crazy but they're your crazy you you've been sealed and in other words God has secured you so that even when the enemy accuses you, his accusation can't undo God's seal on your life. What can separate us from the love of God? Height, depth, goodness, evil, wickedness, principalities, nothing. Nay, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We've been <laughs> that, that, that's why you've got the Holy Ghost because life gets hard sometimes and trauma is real and you can lose your mind and you can lose your sanity and sometimes you can even lose your joy, but you will never lose your salvation because you've been sealed. Somebody ought to declare, I'm sealed. I've been sealed. I may not look like I'm sealed, but I'm sealed. All of the nuclear weaponry in the world world can't undo this seal. Let me go ahead and illustrate it for you. Then I'll let you go. This is the down payment. This is God's earnest money. I was traveling to Ohio for school when I was pursuing my doctorate at United Theological Seminary. And, and, and I flew into Dayton, went to the baggage check and received my luggage got to the hotel and started to unpack. And the first thing I noticed was that my toiletries, my body wash and my lotion busted and leaked out of the containers doing travel. It was a turbulent flight, y'all. And, and now I'm in a panic because the opening session is getting ready to start and I need to change clothes. And, and I'm patting my bag in a panic because all of my clothes for the trip were in jeopardy of being ruined. But imagine the calming relief I felt when I when when I realized that I felt no moisture or no wetness. It turned out that the body wash and the lotion did burst, but it was sealed in a Ziploc bag and it never got out of the bag. So even though my bag made it safely, my clothes were secure because they were protected by the seal. What, 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 what am I trying to tell y'all? I'm trying to tell you that life is a turbulent flight, that, that there's raucous movement, that there are things that bend and break and sometimes the contents leak out. This old body starts to leak. And even when that body starts to leak, there's good news. Your soul has been sealed. Your salvation ain't going nowhere and somebody ought to rejoice because when you receive Jesus Christ, you got the Holy Spirit that holds the contents in your container together. This is the down payment. There's a story of a young man who decided that he wanted to marry the love of his life. And so he went to the jeweler and, and he found the diamond that he wanted. And, and the jeweler told him how much the diamond costs. And can I tell y'all that there was a wide chasm. There, there was a wide gap between what the brother had and what the diamond costs. And so he said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to put it on layaway. So he worked and he worked and he put money aside and, and, and they cast that stone into platinum. And that young man kept putting his money away until one day he came in and he paid for the diamond in full. The next day, couldn't even wait 24 hours later. He was excited after having the ring. He went on the road and he went on to propose. They were in a long distance relationship. And so he had to travel a couple of hours to go and see her. And, and when he got there, he got down on one knee and he said, would you make me the happiest man that ever lived? And then he goes on to say that, that, that here's what I want you to know. This ring that I'm putting on your hand has cost me everything I've got. That you have my life savings on your hand. If ever you and I are out and about and some other guy tries to talk to you, I want, I want you to see that they didn't pay as much as I paid 
to set you aside. That they ain't gave as much as I gave. That, that they have not invested as much as I've invested in. And now they're going to step to you. I know they're going to step to you because you're fine. But, but with this ring, all you've got to do is flash it. And, and the seriousness of the diamond will say to them, you better go talk to somebody else. He, he says, I, I need you to know this because I got to get ready to leave now. I've, I've got to go back home and, and I got to go get back on the road. But don't you worry. If I'm ever coming back, if if you ever miss me and and you want to see me and you wish I was around to take you out to dinner, all you've got to do is look down at that ring because the ring is a promise that I'm coming back. I gave you everything I've got and I'm not going to leave everything I've got with you. Me, me giving you everything means that I'm coming back to get you now. It's going to be some time and and there may be some days that we don't talk as much, but, but I need you to know that I'm coming back. This is a down payment. And y'all know what? He came back. Yes, he did. And he put another ring on it. And he said, now that you've trusted me with this, the rest of my life, whatever money I'll make, whatever God will give me in ministry, whatever my life produces is now yours because you got what I had when I had it. And now you'll get everything else once I get it. That's a progressive down payment. What God says to us is that when you got saved, he gave you the Holy Spirit. And he says, I've got to go back now. I'm up in heaven. But whenever you wonder where I am, all you got to do is look on the inside and, and call that name. And, and you've got everything that I've got. And I'm here to tell you that there's something better about God than a marriage proposal. <laughs> this text says, this text says that the Holy Spirit is the down payment of all of the future inheritance that we're yet to receive. In other words, in other words, if you have ever felt the Holy Spirit calming your heart, if you've ever felt the Holy Spirit reassuring your soul, speaking to you in prayer, that's just a taste of what heaven's going to be like. Glory to God. The, the Holy Ghost is what a small part of what all of God has for us. And all of this has been done to the praise of God's glory and grace. Now, I should have been preaching to some people who are more grateful than, than the way I'm sure some of y'all received that. But, but what I just said, hear me good, is that God saw you in your lowest state and he lifted you and he polished you and he promised you that there is more to come than what has already come. And, and what you should do when you recognize that God has more for you than what he already gave you. The text says it's the praise of his glory and grace. And I wonder if there's anybody here who can help me finish this sermon by declaring praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, praise Son, praise Holy Ghost. I'm done, but y'all didn't do it with me, so I'm going to do it again. Because at some point, you ought to be able to lift up your hands. You ought to be able to lift up your voice in light of what God has done. And you ought to be able to say, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, praise Son, uh, praise Holy Ghost. I just told you what to say, <laughs> but maybe there's something else you need to say. Praise your name uh, for getting me home when I was drunk behind the wheel. <laughs> praise your name uh, for seeing me through a marriage that had my heart uh, on the rocks. Praise your name uh, for getting my kids through college. Praise Father, praise Son, <laughs> praise Holy Ghost. Father, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, we ask that if there are those who are watching and listening today, we, we don't know, we don't know what they stand in need of, but we do know who they need. And we ask, oh God, that if they would hear the knock that you have, that you are just standing at the door of their heart and knocking, we pray in the name of Lord Jesus that you would pardon them of their sins if they would receive you today, that you would rescue them, that you would seal them to the day of redemption. Lord, I act in the name of the Lord Jesus 
that you would reach down and grab somebody, oh God, who is lost, somebody who is brokenhearted today, somebody who needs a touch. Would you grab them by your grace? And oh God, for somebody who is saved, would you give them confidence to put their full weight on you that you can direct and redirect their lives? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, if you heard that sermon today, you heard the word on today and you say, listen, I want to be in relationship with Christ. I want to go to heaven, but, but I don't know if I'm going. Let me tell you, you can know. And the way to know is that you ask Jesus to take control of your life, to confess that he is Lord. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. <laughs> Yeah, my brother. Yeah, my sister. You can be saved. This is what you ought to do. You ought to pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I confess that I'm a sinner and I deserve to go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, that he died on the cross for my sin. And I ask you to save me now, to make me new, to seal me until the day of redemption. And if you pray that prayer, will you let us know? Will you text that word join to 804-601-8569? Maybe, maybe you need a church. You need a place to belong. We invite you to be a part of us. God wants you to grow. God wants to develop you. He wants to mature you. Come on, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for everyone that heard your word today and responded in faith. We give ourselves to you, oh God, now when we pray that you will cause us to flourish with every spiritual blessing in the heavens that you have for us even here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Now listen, now may the grace, love and fellowship of our God rest rule over your life. May he bless you in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears. When the sun rises early and when it sets late until we get to that place and we are going where there is no longer a sunrise and there is no more sunset, that we'll stand before the feet of him who is the light of the world. To him be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And all those who've got the Holy Ghost say it together. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for worshiping with greater joy. Peace. All right. Get up on your feet.